My name is Johannes, and I'm the host of this show. Um, I'm here today with Yasmin Alduri. Um, let me introduce her. She is the co-director and co-founder of the Responsible Technology Hub in Munich. She um, is a business director uh, with a focus on responsible AI at Microsoft. And uh, she is a young global changer of 2022. You, you might want to say something about that. Yes, so I'm one of the uh, Young Global Changers named by the Global Solutions Initiative. So every year they name their Young Global Changers for every year. And I'm one of the changes for 2022. Congratulations on that. Yeah. And then you're also a Land Decker Democracy Fellow um, of 2022 and 2023. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And you studied politics and technology at the Technical University of Munich. Exactly. So that's um, these are uh, great uh, qualifications to, you know, to for for the audience to understand why I'm talking to you um, about today. Today's topic is the Web three. So um, let's let's uh, could you could you explain to my audience and to myself as well because I you know I'm I'm not a specialist in this area. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I focus mostly on AI uh, and machine learning. So if you, if you could um, uh, if you could explain to me and, and my audience what is the Web three? What are we talking about exactly? So actually, Web three is one of my favorite topics besides AI and machine learning, and I think we have a lot of common there when it comes to like AI and all that kind of stuff. But a Web three is actually seen as a decentralized version of a new web. So what we're using currently is seen as being very much centralized. Um, and when we talk about centralization, we talk about the fact that specific figures, specific companies, specific stakeholders have a lot of power that they're holding over the Internet. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're regulating the Internet, but it just means that they're able to very much influence the de further development of uh, the Internet. So Web3, and some people even call it Web3.0, um, they're sometimes seen as a synonym and sometimes people say, no, they're not the same. Um, Basically, what the goal for both of these ideas is, is that we have a kind of web that is decentralized from these big powers. So that, for example, means um, if, if we're using the web, we have more autonomy over our data. Um, it means that if we're using the web, we have more freedoms, um, more privacy, um, and all these ideas behind it. So if, if we could just define it in one sentence, it's the idea of bringing a new web to life, but making it decentralized from these specific big powers that we have in tech. That's, uh, that's, um, that's a great um, summary. Thank you very much. So, so I, I am aware of, of, of Tim Berners-Lee, who, who uh, was um, an early developer of, or, or maybe the, the inventor of the web. Um, he's often credited as such. And also um, a criticism from Jaron Lanier. Um, both of them have have had objections to this term Web three, and also to to the approach that has been taken. Um, could could you speak to that, and also to to the wider problems as to what what could go wrong basically in this in this area? So one of the things before I go into Sir Bernard Lee's uh, aspects. Um, One of the things that we currently have to keep in mind is that we, Web 3 or Web 3.0 doesn't exist right now. So right now it's way more of a movement rather than actually existing technology that we can use. Um, a movement specifically because, as I said earlier, we see that the Internet is being more and more centralized, uh, more and more uh, p big stakeholders, uh, big tech companies mainly, uh, taking over um, the Web And they're very much able to influence the development of it. Um, and they're really able to shape it the way they want to shape it. It has to do a lot with how's your data used? 
Um, is your data even monetized in some kind of way, which most big players already do? Um, Shoshana Zuboff, one of uh, my favorite scholars uh, in the world, um, she actually called this surveillance capitalism. So a new form of capitalism where capitalism has merged into the digital sphere and where data is uh, not only monetized, but it's used to predict behavior. And those predictions are then further sold. So the idea behind this Web3 um, yeah, structure is basically to get away from that. Um, but as I said, we don't necessarily have the technology yet to necessarily build such a place. Um, therefore, it's very much seen as a movement and it's very abstract. And people don't necessarily understand um, what they exactly mean when they say Web3, Web3.0. Um, and this is actually what Bernard Lee even criticizes to some ex ex uh, extension. So he says that specific technologies that we use today, for example, blockchain or cryptocurrencies, which are based on blockchain, um, mm -hmm. some people really say, okay, this is the base for the next web version that we're going to use. So blockchain... Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, so... <laughs> I've heard people say that, yes. You know, people like say, oh, blockchain is the perfect technology for that because it offers privacy. Um, it gives us a place um, where we can handle our data, uh, but at the same time, we still know to some extent who's using what part of the web. Because you, you do have the privacy, but not in a sense of being completely private that you could basically use it for fraud. The problem is that uh, Bernard Lee actually even says that blockchain is probably not the best technology to develop such a new form of web even be, simply because blockchain has been already used for fraud and blockchain in itself is not necessarily decentralized. So oh, could you say something on that? What, what do you mean by it's not decentralized? So one of the things that uh, we're currently seeing when it comes to blockchain development is um, that a lot of VC firms, so venture capital is very much pushed into the blockchain sphere. So when we say, okay, we want to actually build a web that is that is completely decentralized and we don't have any major investors who have a stake in it and who are able to influence the way it's going to be developed, then we need a technology where VC firms are not involved in. And this is not the case with blockchain because most blockchain firms, most blockchain projects are heavily based on angel investors or on VC firms. We're really very much pushing their money into that sphere. So we can't necessarily say, okay, based based on blockchain or if we build a web based on blockchain that this place is going to be decentralized when we already know that the development of blockchain is heavily influenced by VC firms and mm -hmm. investors. So, but, but so what is wrong with the original... So, so the internet as it started... I remember when I was when I was young, um, there there it was actually decentralized, right? So so most people ran their own servers from their house. Uh, you know, I, I mean, not most people, but a lot of people did, and and it was kind of a pain in the behind, if you will. It's 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 you know not so easy to keep it up. You have to always keep it going, right? And you have, you have a lot of um, you know it's easier to rely on Google and Amazon and effectively to 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 uh, host your web services and your website and so on mm -hmm. um wh wh uh, you know why wouldn't that go wrong again in the in the new version of it right you know why would we then feel incentivized or feel good about running our own service because i think that that it requires that right in order for it to be completely uh, decentralized i think so as well so one of the things that i mostly discuss with people when we talk about this specific point um, is the fact that when the web was first built or created, even by Tim Berners-Lee, um, the idea was to build a place where we can share information and connect. And this idea is still happening in the current web version that we're having. The only difference is that our data is being monetized. So the difference is that a new digital economy has emerged out of the first aspects of the web. So now we're basically moving from a, we're using this place for free information sharing and for connecting. And now it turned into a whole economy, a whole digital economy where data is not even monetized, but it's the number one currency, if you can even call it that. So 
yes, there are discussions of how can we make a Web3 or how can we create it in a way that the former inventors actually had in mind. And there are different aspects. I mean, uh, Tim Berners Lee is working on his own version of uh, decentralized web, as far as I know, and I think he actually got a lot of investors in there as well. Uh, solid, I think it's called. Uh, so, uh, yeah, solid. The, the exactly, project. exactly, exactly. So he's working on that project as well. Um, he hasn't necessarily disclosed what kind of technology he he uses. The only thing that he did say, and that was this, that was at the Web Summit 2022 in the Sabon. So last year. Mm -hmm. Please give a huge standing ovation for the creator of the web, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Web Summit. Thank you, Lisbon. It's great to be back in Lisbon and awesome to be at the Web Summit. So I'm going to bring you, uh, next few minutes, I'm going to bring you to a certain extent some celebration. It's been almost 30 years uh, since I started this web thing. And I'm going to bring you some concerns. Uh, he disclosed uh, he's not using blockchain. Uh, right, right. That's, that's he's he doing something at MIT. As, as if I understand that I read earlier a little bit uh, up on this <laughs> before we met um, on, on this project, um, Solid. It seems to be based at MIT. Mm -hmm. And it seems also to be based very much on... Uh, just the the standards, you know, the W three C standards, and and it seems to be sort of a linked data approach, which I've I've been working with 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 you know sort of semantic web technologies in the past, so I, I kind of am familiar with this. So I think that's that is he, he's all, he's been involved with sem semantic with the semantic web, and yeah. I think that's what it is based on in in, in part, and I, I don't exactly know the details. But it's an MIT project, if I understand correctly. He actually has not shared as much detail. And I think one of the reasons why he didn't do it is because they're still working on it. Mm -hmm. And they're not, I mean, they're experimenting. It does make sense to experiment and to see, like, to falsify your hypothesis and then see, okay, does it make sense um, before you go on and, you know, publish it and publish what the technology is based on. Um, but one thing that, that we know from, from Bernal Lee is that he's very adamant about um, data privacy. And mm -hmm. he has been a huge critic, actually, um, about like the big tech firms, where he, he's had said in so many instances where he said this, this new digital economy has actually pushed big tech to this race of data, like this big data race. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, the winner of this race is uh, able to to control most of the behavior of the users of the internet. So, yes, some people say, you know, I don't really care about my data privacy. What should they do? Like, yeah, I'm sharing my data, whatever, uh, or I'm, I'm going to use Facebook anyways. Great. They know that I had my Big Mac last night. I don't care about it. Um, <laughs> we should, you know, we should care about it because uh, at the end of the day, they have this data. We don't know what kind of data they have most of the time. We don't know where our data is sold to. Um, and most importantly, uh, we don't know what the profits are. So we might say we don't care, but if we knew what the profits would be if we were able to share our data and if we would be included in the profits, mm -hmm. I think that would be a whole other discussion that we are having. So that's what you're talking about, basically. So that's part of the Web3 then, to to share um, to, to, to share in the profits that the data Provide, uh, that the data creates. There's a book by, by Jaron Lanier about this topic as well called Who Owns the Future? I've, I've read through that and it's very, it's been a while since I read it, but uh, it's very much in that vein. So it, 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 it talks about how, how we could have micropayments every time our data is used in a useful way. Yeah. And so I, I understand that. And, and that could, of course, create another host of of unforeseen problems, actually, right? And, you know, yeah. <laughs> could, could you speak to that, perhaps? Of course. So one of the things with Web3, I mean, as I said, it's a movement, but one of the goals is to give back autonomy to the users. And when we talk about autonomy, we talk about controlling your own data and being able to make a profit out of it. Um, the idea behind it is to basically find a way to make data a right. Not necessarily a human right, but to at least have a right to own your data. We kind of 
kind of have a legislation in Europe with the GDPR that kind of hints towards us owning our data, but at the same time, it's not necessarily defined clearly. Um, but the general idea is to say, okay, uh, we want to have some kind of data dignity. I think that's what he calls it. Um, it's basically the idea of saying, okay, people have a right to own their data. People have the possibility and the freedom to share their data, but people also have the right to make a profit out of their data. So if we're saying, you know, all these big tech firms are making a huge profit um, out of all the data that they're collecting from us, which we essentially are giving up for free for their services that are not even as much worth as our um, as what we're sharing with them. Yeah, I don't even understand what is Facebook really for, actually. I mean, that's, you know, I, I've never understood. Are we the users or are we the product? I think we are the product, frankly. I mean, there... <sighs> I can't remember where I read it or if I've heard it in a podcast. I'm not 100% sure anymore. But um, there were two people who actually talked about what is Facebook and what is Google. And both of them are just marketing firms at the end of the day. Because right. we're just being sold ad ads the entire time. And yeah. uh, they're all individualized. So at the end of the day, you could really say it's, it's a marketing firm. They're, mm -hmm. they're marketing us ads as personalized as possible. So, so they're also an entertainment firm, maybe, right? Because people perhaps are entertained by scrolling the, scrolling the whatever it is uh, they call it. I mean, yeah, but at the same time, if you look at specific, the case with Facebook, they're not necessarily searching for entertainment or searching for making people entertain. It's way more getting people hooked. So mm -hmm. uh, if... Uh, but what's the difference between that and TV? I mean, TV also wanted to... You know, the, the, the stories should be hook, it, hook you, should hook you, right? I mean, I guess ideally any any form of entertainment is, is meant to hook you in some ways, right? But what is the difference in that? The difference is that uh, behavioral predictions are used. So they're not only using your data for the behavioral predictions, but also to see how can they get you most hooked. With TV, it's a bit different because you're not individualized. The TV can't make individualized ads for you, can't... Uh, I mean, we have specific ethics for, for uh, showing stuff on TV, you know, while with Facebook, it's easy to show you racist propaganda um, coming into um, violence, all that kind of stuff, like really negative, negative imagery that triggers you and that triggers negative emotions. Because what a lot of psychological researchers have actually found out is that we react way more to negative input than to positive input. So we get hooked. And Facebook actually understood that very, very easily. So all these Facebook fights that you see in the comment sections, they're provoked willingly because they know they get people hooked. So that's 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 a huge difference to, to the TV. Like... At the end of the day, you know, at the TV also, when, when, we, when they're using their ad um, um, pauses, I mean, when you, I don't know, watch a movie, specifically in Germany, for example, if you use cable and you watch a movie in one of the channels that are offered, you always have, like, at least pauses, like, every 20 minutes, like, ad pauses. I remember as a child, we always used, we used those times, those five, ten minutes to, to go to the bathroom, to get something to eat, to get something to drink. So we necessarily weren't there watching ads all the time. But with the social media, it's a little bit different. And I think the fact, to bring it back to the topic, um, the fact that we're consuming so, much, so many ads and that um, these social media platforms are generally able to hook us so much really says a lot about how much money they're making and how much profit they're actually making. So in my eyes, it's honestly very fair to say, okay, you know what, actually give the people who are actually, whose data it's, it's from, give them a part or at least like have, have them involved in the profit making. And Darren Linnea actually even calls, I think he called it some kind of, socialist version of, of capitalism. So, you know, you, you're including them, you're including them in the capitalistic system, um, but you're including them in the profit-making. So, uh, 
this this I, that, that's kind of the idea of data dignity like the right to own every piece of data that is associated with with your existence but the problem is and this is probably now answering your question <laughs> one of the main issues is there are like two major critiques on this approach um if we say, okay, we want to include everyone in the profit making of ads, specifically when it's based on our data, we have to define who's owning data. So right, one of one of the first steps people are thinking of is, oh, you know what, let's just make, let's just come up with a human right to own data. And it's, it's a human right approach, which to some extent I fully go on to because I feel like, you know, if, if this is the utmost personal information of yours, it should be yours and it should be yours to right. deal with. But the problem, but with I mean, having... but do you need, do you need a, a special human right? I mean, if, if, if I own my computer, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just property, right. Right. I mean, could, could it, could you not just see that as just another, another form of property, right. Uh, rather than, you know, the special type of right that we call human right. What, what's the difference there between owning your house and owning your data? I think the biggest issue is like the international sphere. So human rights are norms mm. that have been decided upon. Like most countries agree that there are specific human rights that we all adhere to. They're norms that yeah. everyone is yeah. okay with and agrees to. And well, except for really me. important ones, right? Like Dubai and, and Saudi Arabia, they are positioning themselves to be extremely important. I mean, you, have, the... you have authoritarian states who don't respect them 100%, but they yeah. all these countries still signed the Charter of Human Rights, you know? Mm. All of them yeah. signed some kind of charter and all of them agreed when they joined the UN at some point to, at, to some extent, adhere to them. So... We know there's yeah. a set of norms that everyone understands and everyone has at least or has agreed upon it to some degree. We can discuss mm -hmm. or we can have a whole discussion about whether authoritarian states are doing this or not. But from their point of view, they're doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, making it a human right would elevate it on an international sphere. So you wouldn't have, for example... Germany would define it as a property right and then you go to France and they would not necessarily say it's a property right it might be in another norm so I see I see it's, that it's makes sense. legit it's about the universal universal understanding of it and some mm -hmm. like one of the major critiques is the disadvantage it would have on small scale enterprises so some ethicists would argue mm -hmm. that a human right to owning data would be very impractical because it would disadvantage um, smaller businesses and thereby actually giving more power to the big techs or even more. And one of the reasons behind it is that uh, smaller enterprises wouldn't be able to afford the data anymore. So for a big mm -hmm. tech, uh, it would be easier to say, you know what? Yeah, okay, let's do the human right. We pay for all the data and our customers or users get a little share of it. Great. Um, but at the end of the day, they're at a point now, the hierarchy within the big, within the tech um, industry has been made in such a way that there's basically no more reaching of Facebook. A small scale enterprise, mm. the chances for them reaching Facebook or Google are very, very limited. Or the oh, that level very, of, very of size, you mean? Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Absolutely. So most of the startups that you see mostly don't even have enough funding to to keep up, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So some actually. Well, I mean, say, often okay, the goal is to sell, right? Often the goal of, of such a startup is to sell to Facebook or Google. Actually, in the end, uh, often you hear people speak about that. Oftentimes, you know, sell, yes. you know they're, they're trying to sell <laughs> their company. Yeah, but then again, you would actually stabilize their power position within the market, you know. So at the end of the day, you're not really helping mm -hmm. small enterprises. You're not uh, helping medium enterprise. You don't. You're not helping local uh, businesses with it. And um, most importantly, you're um, 
it's it's really hard to say whether it's going to hinder innovation or not. Um, but there are people who are criticizing this specific right to hum um, human right to data by saying, you know what, if we're not able to push small enterprises, you're most probably going to hinder innovation this way because mm -hmm. these small um, businesses are not able to fundraise so much money to get the data that they need for either experimenting with products or um, with be it marketing or advertisement. But why couldn't this be solved by, by means of um, subsidies? So, so if governments equaled the, the playing field and, and, and mm -hmm. gave subsidies to small or smaller companies to make up for this lack of funding, ultimately, and then you could still have a right to own your data. And, and maybe this right to own your data is, is in a way, you know, it, it, it seems to be more important I mean, there, there, are, there are, you know, there, in the end, there is, there is a hierarchy to these kind of uh, priorities or to, to import, you know, to, 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 to such things, to, to ethics even, right? You have trade-offs in a way. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that owning your own data, I mean, the data that you produce as a, in the course of living your life, um, should, should be somewhat uh, more, should, should be sort of a, at a higher uh, level of importance than whether or not small companies can afford it. because you can solve that in another way right you could solve that in a way by means of subsidies really could you not you could 100 percent, but you have to also understand that most governments have an interest in keeping a human right to owning data away from them because they're also to some degree uh, very much positively affected by this um, you mostly see um, governments cooperating with big tech firms or with smaller tech firms, um, mm. be it on security issues, be it on uh, how can we market our next campaign, um, all these kind of things, you know. And I think, at least from my perspective, I think governments have a huge interest to keep this as low as possible. So subsidizing would most probably be only possible if you have a more liberal point of view in within the government and mm -hmm. a point of view that is pushing way more the the aspect of humanitarian norms if you can say it like that um yeah it makes sense but then on the other hand you know how do you get them to cooperate with or how do you get them to agree on the on the human rights element in the first place right so so maybe Maybe there's some linkage there, you know, if you could, you, because I mean, the reason why they don't agree is because of the small companies and, uh, you know, it seems a bit circular to then, you know, maybe, maybe it could be written in the same law that, uh, that, that makes it a human right to own your data to then also have a right as a small company to access that's, data that's in a way you would for fund. Yeah, you would definitely, like, at least from the government perspective, you would need a government that is somehow liberal but also leftist enough to care mm. about human right to data and to be honest mm. to be very very frank i don't think that's uh realistic in any way at least not speaking for germany i think finding coalition right. is already right. super hard in the bundestag um so in the german parliament and i don't think mm. that the interests really much align for the stakeholders um, that's that's the one thing. The other thing is also the question of whether we, as a country, align on a human right aspect, but also whether other countries align on it, because we can define yeah, data as a, data ownership as a human right, but the question is whether mm. other countries define it the same way. Well, right. That's the whole point of the human right aspect, right? As you said earlier. And and exactly. so, so right. I mean, the even, whole reason why we have them is because p countries agree. So we have to get a whole new agreement about around human rights, specifically exactly. to data. Is that is that right? Yeah, we need basically an international policy where everyone agrees that a specific norm is set for data ownership, and we're slowly having this discussion of on an international level. So you see this happening. I mean, the EU, as I said, with the GDPR, started doing this, started pushing for this debate. You see it happening in Canada, where Canada has their own version of the GDPR now. 
Uh, same thing with California. Um, we see it happening also with the AI Act, where data is also heavily regulated. Um, so we see countries actually, you know, understanding the value of data and wanting to change something about it. The problem is it's heavily Western oriented, meaning it's mostly European countries or North American countries that are very much focused on this, while the rest of the world, you know, most industrialized countries are like working on this, but other countries are left out of the entire dis uh, discussion. And that's an issue. Um, yeah, it is. And, and it's also a centralization. So, so you're saying that basically a part of this, this the fix for, for decentralization or of de decentralization is actually a very centralized one, right? Because what we're talking about is government policies, right? That's actually the, the, the epitome, the, 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 the absolute definition of what is centralized, right? What we need, uh, and I don't necessarily mean that government has to have ownership over the internet, what we need is a some kind of third entity, something that very, like, um, I think, let me think about it. Jaren Lenya actually uh, talked about this as well. So what we need is a third entity or a third be it an organization, be it an interstate organization, international organization whatsoever, that is regulating the internet and making sure that it's staying free and that the data that is used there and that is harvested there and that is monetized is, um, first of all, kept private. So privacy is super, uh, super important. Um, so that you can't necessarily like sell your data from A to B to C to D and then it ends up with Z. Um, but that... Uh, the users know exactly where their data is and who's who's using it and who's profiting off of it. Um, and second of all, a place that is safe. So when we talk about Web3, yeah, we talk about autonomy, but what is less talked about is the safety of the internet. Um, and and what, what do you mean by safety? Uh, so, so viruses, computer viruses, or um, are, you, are you talking on that level? Or what do you mean by safety? I mean, in, in, in this case, what I mean with safety is one... Uh, a safe environment, meaning like where content is not shared that is harmful. Number one. Uh, number two, a uh, place where platforms are not allowed that uh, harbor harmful things that can be sold. I'm uh, mostly thinking of the dark web. Mm -hmm. So dark web will always exist no matter what we do. There will be some kind of form where people will exchange in a, in a place where they're completely an anonymous. That's that's just a fact. Um, but if we do build a Web3, we need to think about uh, the possible consequences it could have, whether it could possibly even push the dark web even more. So these things have to be kept in mind. And the third part is uh, the, from a cybersecurity perspective. So making sure that uh, viruses are not easily transmitted through the web. Um, and making sure that it's secure, so not only safe, but from a security perspective, um, safe to use your computers without being infested with viruses, for example, or not being necessarily able to, to use the Web3 to stage cyber attacks to companies, to, to states, to um, critical infrastructure. So, so these are the kind of things that are not as much talked about. Um, and I hope that more people will talk about this, but it's probably the case because, as I said, Web3 is not a place yet. Right now, it's just a theoretical concept. And um, when we when we talk about a third entity or a body, an organizational body that um, kind of oversees these data transactions, um, it needs to be a neutral one. It needs to be not a state or a UN organization or whatever, it needs to be a neutral body that oversees what exactly is happening on the web and how exactly the data is transmitted, who's making what profit, and most importantly, it needs to be kind of linked to a platform where users can actually control their data as well. So we like to call this, at the Responsible Technology Hub, we call this a data wallet. Um, yeah. I think Le Linier calls it something else. Um, 
but we like to call it a data wallet because it makes more sense like just from an imaginary point of view like if you look at your wallet you mostly know this is my credit card there's my id etc etc and we think of it that way because we need some kind of platform where we can have an overview of where's my data used who's using it who's making what profit of it who sold it to whom and most importantly when we're saying controlling our data be able to take away the right from them using it so this active approach of saying the user is actively able to decide who's going to have your data and who's not going to have it and be actively able to decide when to take away that right again. So this will obviously change business models. So most of the business models we see in the digital economy right now are not going to work this way. Um, also, I mean, there's the second critique that a lot of people also call when they talk about um, a possible human right to owning data um, is the idea that such a right could potentially create a dystopian society. Oh, could you uh, explain that, please? That's uh, very interesting. So, uh, in, wh in what ways would that right, like a right, so that's very interesting. A right creating a dystopia uh, is, is, is a new one for me. Yeah, un unfortunately it is. Um, I mean, it's hypothetically speaking and it's theoretically speaking, so we don't know whether it's going to happen or not. Um, and it's a risk doesn't mean that we don't have we can't do it it's just mm -hmm. a risk that is there and that is sure existing but in what way like how does that work what is the mechanism that is proposed have, such a, a, a have you ever that? watched the series funny on Netflix funny that we're talking about this right now uh, mm -hmm. called Maniac no I have to admit I have not seen that so it's a, a series that is basically depicting society that runs on ads um, so people can basically sell their time for services such as, for example, getting food, um, at a restaurant or one of my favorite scenes is when one of the protagonists was buying, uh, was trying to buy a ticket for public transportation and he basically doesn't have money anymore. So he is forced to sell his time and what exactly do they do? So in order to get these services, um, they have to listen through individual people just um, reading out loud targeted ads for them. Wow. And they basically have to do it through the entire service act. So if he's taking um, a bus with public transportation from A to B, he's basically forced to listen to all of the targeted ads that an individual next to you is reading out loud for you. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very funny. It's called Maniac. Um, that's just the society that they're describing. Actually, it goes, the, the, the actual plot is completely different. Um, mm -hmm. But that's basically the base of the society that they're living in. Um, and many people actually criticize that an approach to, to owning your human, to having a human right to owning your data um, could, or having even the possibility to sell the, your data could actually lead to some kind of dystopian version of that kind of... Um, plot that I told you about. So they say that uh, ultimately this can basically lead to further additional inequities. That's what I want to say. So some people might be forced to sell their data just to make ends meet because they're at the end of the month they don't have enough money. So they're saying, you know what? Let's just sell the data to Facebook and make a little bit money by the end of the month so we can get through this month. Um, and some people don't have to do it. So privacy actually becomes a luxury. It's not a right anymore. So while you do bring in the, the right of owning data to have data ownership, what it also means when you're selling your data is that some people don't have to sell their data because... They're at a place of privilege and they have enough money to not do it. So they're able to afford privacy. So instead of giving people the autonomy, this could actually possibly lead to people, yeah, even pushing themselves more to be marketing targets. And that's actually something we want to prevent. So we have this really big shadow lurking over uh, making data a human right because we also know doing that 
but also allowing people to sell their data could actually lead to this kind of dystopian version. I see. That's a very interesting take on it. But I mean, this, this could be said about anything really when, when, when you have a, a disparity, particularly a, a very large one between people who the haves and the haves nots, so to speak. I mean, anything falls into this category. You could say that, you know, prostitution actually is, is like that, right? I mean, in a way. And uh, you, you could say that, um, uh, I mean, you know, even work is like that, right? Some people don't have to work and, 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 and some people do. And, and you know, that's uh, that, that in itself. I mean, inequality is something that is very natural in our society. It has been there forever since we existed. So obviously it's going to stay yeah. there. But what we're trying to prevent is making it even more unequal. Right. And when we're at a point where we're discussing whether privacy is a right or privacy is a luxury, we're at a point where we're, you yeah. know, making inequalities even more apparent. And it can't... Right. But, it can't but couldn't this be solved? Okay, so I, I, I don't fully agree that it's always been there, right? So we can see that in the last 30 years in America and in Europe... Um, I think also in, in other places, inequality has increased um, in a way that is pretty dramatic. And it's probably, you know, we're arriving at a, at a, at a, at a point where it's similar to where, what it was during the Gilded Ages, I suppose. But there were periods and there are places where, where inequality is lower, right? And I guess that could be the solution to it, right? So whatever they are doing, you know, for example, the Nordic countries, um, you know, mm -hmm. basically... <clears throat> having a, a new form of, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to call it socialism because I don't think that's actually appropriate. It's I don't think it's actually that. No, it, it isn't that. Americans often call it that. Right? And, and even Bernie Sanders even calls himself a socialist. I think these, these terms are, uh, this term is misleading in, in, in many ways. But, uh, but, but uh, you know, there are right now societies where inequality is very low, right? So if you were to, for example, roll out um, data ownership in Norway, I don't think you would have this problem that you described, right? So so maybe there is this bigger problem that just pervades, you know, every aspect of society, including this one. And then if you if you solve that one, right? So so it's it's in a way what I'm saying is we, we have multiple policy policy instruments, right? We we can't really solve the whole world problem with with you know one in, in, you know, with one policy instrument, with, with say, calling uh, the right to own your data a human right, right? So if you did that, that, you know, based on other problems that are in existence now, uh, that could potentially cause some other uh, inequities, right? So that's what we're saying. Yeah. But, but so what I'm, what I'm thinking is, you know, that, that these problems would all go away if we really, if we did the things that we know could be done, that, that have been done in some places, that it would actually change you know, the inequity problem. I mean, it's also, it really depends on what kind of inequalities are you talking about. So, you know, there are some statistics that even say before COVID hit, uh, we were marching towards more equality in v various Western countries that we were getting better. And then mm -hmm. COVID hit. And then all of a sudden, oh, we're not that equal. And yeah. I don't necessarily think it's... Uh, inequality increasing i think it just has become more apparent right Absolutely. i think we're in in a state now in our society where we're way more transparent about these topics so when we talk about inequality we are not only talking about um unequal treatment of genders we're not only talking about the poverty rate we're also talking about ethnicities and uh problems within societies when it comes to racism and discrimination, when it comes to discriminating the LGBTQI community, for example. So, you know, inequities are seen in various forms. So if you look at the Nordic countries, they might not have the same inequities that we have. And they might not face the same problems as we do. Migration is, for example also an issue in the Nordic countries, but they, it's not as high of an issue as it is, for example, in Germany. Mm, why, why is that? Oh, okay. Maybe we're wearing off too far. Um, I think, uh, <clears throat> maybe just to answer that is most people don't necessarily want to move to the Nordic countries because it's cold. Oh, yeah. Okay. So 
<laughs> right. I, I would have said this is one of the major issues. So I wouldn't necessarily see Sweden as a country of, of migrants such as Germany. Mm. In Germany, you have uh, one fourth. So 25 percent of the people who live here have a migration history. Mm -hmm. And with migration history, that also means like they're first generation Germans or even second generation Germans. So right. this country is very much built through migrants. So right. the issues. So there's have... no problem, right? Then, like, I mean, it, there is a problem that unfortunately these migrants have to leave wherever they're leaving from, and and there's a problem there. But for, from the German perspective, why does it have to be a problem, right? It's it's also often this presumption that there's a problem. There's a lot of migration. We have to describe it. We have to say it's a problem. But what do we really have to say that? <laughs> I, I don't see I don't it as a problem. I honestly don't think it's a problem at all. I mean, I'm a first generation German myself. Both my parents were not born in Germany, so I don't see mm -hmm. it as a problem. I think it's an enriching thing to have in a country to to have more perspectives and it actually enriches the culture and enriches the innovation that is going on. So I Absolutely. personally don't think that, but you still see that there are different opinions on this. And we yeah. just saw it recently in Germany, we had the New Year's evening um, discussion. So basically some, some riots were happening throughout Germany and all of a sudden we started blaming migrants for it or uh, the first generation Germans, which doesn't make sense, but it shows their unequal discussions even made. Yeah. So the way things are perceived are just different from country to country. Well, so interestingly, I mean, I don't know if it's like this in Germany, but in, in America, um, often the, the people who are afraid of migrants or who do not like them or who have an issue with it are often people who are not exposed to actual migrants. And, and, and those places that are actually exposed to a lot of migrants, like New York City and Los Angeles, they don't have a problem with migration. <laughs> and that's really the interesting thing, right? If you're in some small town where nobody wants to go to, you will have this perceived problem with, uh, with, with immigration, but you actually don't experience it. So those people who experience it don't have a problem with it. It's very, I mean, this seems to be a regularity, at least in the U.S., I don't know if this is also true in Germany. I, I haven't lived in Germany for close to 30 years. I am actually from Germany myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I am, uh, well, I don't know, zero generation American. Uh, <laughs> and now I live in England. So, so anyway. <laughs> that's, uh, no, I totally so get it. I embrace I it. it. <laughs> I embrace no, I, I, no I, I definitely get that. And I, I have lived abroad as well and I've moved for a while from Germany and I'm probably going to do it in the future as well again so I completely get it what I'm just trying to say with this is that depending on where you are there are going to be inequities based on the discussions that you have based on who's more powerful in a in a just a hierarchical stance from what when it comes to society and oftentimes, specifically in Germany, we see that migrant families are mostly also the worker families. So, and that's mainly has to do with the history of Germany, with uh, Germany being rebuilt and ne needing workers and bringing them from outside of Germany. And right. when we look at the generations that came after those, those uh, workers who came and who stayed, we often see that it's way harder for them, for example, to climb up the social ladder or climb up the education ladder. Yeah. It's slowly but surely happening more, but we see that there are inequalities already. So to come back to the, to the dystopian uh, thought of uh, having such a society where society is run by ads, um, you will see that specific minorities in societies will most probably have to give away their privacy to be able to afford their living. And that's an issue because it's going to be the minorities. It's going to be the people who are already all the way down in the hierarchical stance. Yeah, but at the same time, you give them another option to make some money and maybe in, in, at least in the, in the, in the space of, of money, right? In the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, be a little bit more equal in the sense that they are selling that it, okay, other people are not selling their data because they don't have to. I understand privacy. Uh, I understand this problem where privacy becomes um, a luxury, uh, which really shouldn't. I, I, I completely agree with that. But at the same time, you're, 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 
you're giving now an, an option to to be at least less um, less unequal in in the in the in the money domain, exactly. right? By by allowing that, so so it's 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 kind of yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I don't know. I feel I always feel that there should be some, you know, if if you have the right mix of policy instruments, right? So aside from this, you know, human right, you know, if 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 you embed this idea of of making a human right to own your own data, I, I see I see this as a I can see this as a a, a huge um, ben, benefit to a lot of people. So so then, you know, at the same time, you might also have to do a few other things. In order to to fix this problem that you're describing, and you know, so so I, I think, like you said, it's a risk, right? It's a risk. It's, it's not. Definitely it's not. A risk. Yes. But at the same time, when if if you address this risk, right? So it's in anything else. If you're building something, you you have to address a number of risks. Um, I mean, this is where you know the critics of the critics come in and say, you know, yeah. yeah uh, we're, we might be creating inequalities, but actually we're giving people another income stream. So this yeah. way, we're actually, when it comes to poverty, we're bringing the people back together. And yeah. we know for a fact that poverty is the number one uh, indicator of education success, of yeah. health yeah. success, etc. So yeah, we might even say we're actually going to make society more equal. The question mm -hmm. is just whether we're ready to say, Okay, we're gonna have a society where people are paying, uh, not paying, but like basically selling their privacy, mm -hmm. and people who are not, and whether this has is, is, is then gonna become a status symbol, you know? Yeah. But another approach, which I've just read recently, so I can't give you too much details to be honest, is uh, that some people are saying, you know what, uh, we could also just find a middle ground, and instead of saying. Um, everyone like has the right to sell their data or not, we're going to make data a human right, but we're just going to make a universal basic income out of it. Yeah, so okay. So whatever, whatever profit the big tech companies make with your data, they have to give each and every one of the society a specific margin of it. So that way a government can actually prepare or even offer universal basic income to each and every one of the users. But then, then and, you're keeping the, 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 the current state status, right? So where, where, where Facebook does still own your data, they just have to share the profit from using it in a way, right? So, so they still remain the owners of your data. So, then, so, so you're getting away with, you're, you're getting rid of the whole idea of, of, of data ownership as a private right. Yes and no, because right now they're owning your data nevertheless. So you never really had a chance to even say yes or no. I see. But well, yeah, have... you do in the beginning, right? When they say, "Oh, when you sign up, you know, you're acknowledging that." Yeah, but even then, even then, even if you uh, reject all the cookies, for example, even then they're able to track you, and even then they're able to take some of your data. So yes, we have specifically in Europe, um, it's it's harder for big tech to do that. But, but wait, hold on. Still... Also, if you don't sign up with Facebook, can they still get your data? So yes, if you're, if you're just not there and you're not, they can't. They can actually. They can get it because they're uh, obviously selling and uh, buying data from other sources. So oh, we saw, for example, um, there was this uh, financial app where you can file your taxes. They basically sold all their data to Facebook. Hmm. So at this point, we're at a point where we really don't know which data they have from us right. and right. where our data is sold to. Uh, yeah, so that's also a problem that we don't know, right, where it is. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So one of the ideas is to either say, okay, uh, if we can't control it anyways, um, let's just make sure that we have this right to mm. own data ship so we can then say, okay, the people actually have a right to get a profit off of it. And based mm. on that idea, you could say, since we can't control them anyways, let's just make a basic income, universal basic income out of it. So we're tax sending heavy. We're making sure that they're actually paying what's due to the society, and this way we can make sure, like, make sure to some extent that uh, people are getting their profit out of. But the income. incentives of hooking you, all of those things are still there, right? Uh, they are there, nevertheless, right? In that, in that solution, that is not solved, right? All of this problem with it's, not solved. it's still surveillance capitalism will still th thrive. It would still be there. 
Um, and it probably be the next version of, of surveillance capitalism would probably be even more uh, surveillance behind it. So, right. so owning yes. your own data, right, would stop that. So if everyone had the right to own the data and control it, like you said, in the other, in the other solution, the, the data exactly. wallet solution, that would solve all of these problems. And then it might add a little bit of this kind of dystopian inequality problem if we don't if we don't do something about it, right? So, but we might also be able to do something about it. So, I don't know. I'm still veering toward the data wallet wallet approach. Same, uh, to same. Be honest. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely. I'm a fan girl of uh, Jaren Lanier. Um, Myself, I, I am. Not, I absolutely, yeah. I absolutely love this idea, and I think it's uh, long overdue that we have some kind of approach like this. Um, as I said, yes, there are risks, but you will always have risks with such policies. But most importantly, and I think this is the number one thing that we have to think of, it forces the big tech firms to reevaluate their business models. Because right now their business models are completely uh, focused on uh, collecting as much data as possible, making sure that they're able to make behavior predictions and selling those behavior predictions. And as long as we're not able to kind of force them to change. And I'm going to be very honest. I don't think a bottom up approach is going to work. Um, because even if we all as users come together and say, we're not going to use Facebook or Google. Or no, no, but if you produce something else as an alternative. So I guess I, I speak to a lot of people who say, well, we, we don't have to just, just be consumers, right? We can also be, I guess they call it prosumers, <laughs> so producing <laughs> consumers, right? So, so in 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 other words, and, and so that 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 also brings me to a question. Actually, I wanted to ask you because I think it's not complete to talk about Web three without getting a little bit into the rejection of why crypto isn't it, right? Because a lot of people say um, crypto blockchain, this this mm -hmm. combination, um, because a lot of people who are in that space in the blockchain space say that they are Web three, right? So so there is also that. We should at least address it. I, I, I know that that the the actual Web three doesn't exist, as you said, um, but but we should address it. Why is crypto not it, and why isn't that solving? And why isn't this sort of decentralized, um, you know, I guess the peer to peer economy and all of those those elements? I, I spoke with uh, Somil Gupta about this. Um, one of one of my guests. Um, uh, at length about the, the the sharing economy, the peer to peer economy, and all all of all of those were part of that in the collabor collaborative economy. So so there, uh, we we can just build new things, right? We can build new things. We're doing it. We're building crypto solutions to all kinds of things, right? That would be the argument. So why isn't that Web three? Why isn't that you know the the you know ultimate? And, and you know I think. You know, we already addressed, you know, Berners Lee's um, critique a little bit, <clears throat> but uh, but we, we we have to, I think, do a little bit work a little bit harder to reject it. You know, why why are they not? You know, why are they wrong saying that they are web they are working in the Web three area? I mean, there are some people who say that the metaverse is Web three. Yes, yes, I heard that too. With, the problem with saying something is something without defining <laughs> it from the get go is the I main issue. Problem. So right. if we we're saying blockchain in itself, blockchain is a te technology. Yeah. So we're using it for specific things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a place that we're defining as, as Web3. It's not like the web where you can actually use it. Um, it's a technology. and one of the But you can build websites on it, right? You can, uh, exactly. you can, you can have data there. So, so it seems a bit webbish. <laughs> yes, but it's still centralized. So somebody is like blockchain is not just an entity that is owned by everyone. Somebody is still behind it, running it. Um, but Ethereum, is is, like, I mean, if, so more, the, the ecosystem. More or less, is but Ethereum is still built upon investors. And as I said mm -hmm. earlier, one of right. the main issues is if you have too much VC capital in there, and right. if you have right. too much VC influence in there, you're going to be pretty sure about the fact that they're going to be able to influence the development of that blockchain project. So is your solution basically to throw them all out, uh, to, to have no VCs? And I mean, what would happen to all of those people and, and their money? And, you know, they want to work on projects. They want to make the world a better mm -hmm. place, they say. 
no i wouldn't necessarily that wouldn't be my solution i just wouldn't call blockchain web3 okay so, so but in this new system like in this in this not well defined system that doesn't exist so mm -hmm. if, if and we're saying that that vcs wouldn't have much control there what what would they do right what would they do with their money and why can't they be part of the solution right and, and in other words it's like they they have all of this capital sitting around which with which they could pay people to build solutions to problems that we're facing And, and you're saying they shouldn't be part of it, or they shouldn't be part. Of, they shouldn't be in control of it. What what exactly are you saying about them? They shouldn't be giving too much power. I see. And I think that is the big difference because we will always have people who are going to invest into projects. Uh, we're always going to have some firms, be it VC cap, uh, VC firms, be it uh, big tech companies, be it angel investors who are going to see projects and they're going to love them and they're going to think this is something that we can change the world with. Whether they're going to profit off of it or not, that's a whole other question. But we will have these people who will put their own money into projects. And that's fine. We live in a capitalist world where this is ongoing and this is a freedom that they're able to do. The only thing that I'm critiquing is that we're not we're not supposed to give these people too much power. But and what if they then just say, now? we'll take our ball and take it home and we're not going to participate if we don't get any power for this money that we're investing? Exactly. But... The main issue right now is that blockchain projects are 99% made through VCs. So there is mm. almost no possibility for the normal user to participate. There's mostly no opportunity for state governments, for regulators, for public sectors, for example, to invest in that as well. So right now it's very much privately developed, if you can say it like that. So this obviously raises concerns that this is giving way too much power to investors um, while the public is completely shunned out of it. So that's the one thing. The other thing is um, the question of uh, maintaining a Web3. If Okay, if we say Web3 is blockchain, mm -hmm. obviously to some kind of way this Web entity needs to be maintained, right? Mm -hmm. So the question here comes if we talk about this kind of web being completely decentralized and this is what mostly blockchain people and mostly crypto people say is that mm -hmm. this kind of web would be made for the people by the people. Yeah, yes, that's exactly what I heard. That's mostly what people say, at least in that field. And the main problem with that is that they're completely ignoring, okay, if it's for the people and by the people, who's maintaining it? Yeah. And one pe some people say, you know what, uh, it's the people themselves maintaining it and they're getting mm -hmm. a token from it. Because yeah. they're maintaining that space, they're going to be able to um, earn a token, earn uh, some kind of cryptocurrency, for example, also. Um, exactly. But there will be, in some kind of way... Um, giving a reimbursement for that work. Mm -hmm. The problem is we're not at a point where cryptocurrency has reached a level where everyone is um, seeing it as a real currency. Mm -hmm. We saw it with FTX with currently going completely down. Um, we see a lot of cryptocurrency projects uh, completely failing because they're based on fraud. I'm not saying yeah. that all the cryptocurrency projects are fraudulent. Definitely not. 100% not. Um, mm. But we see many of these projects just going down right now because people are losing trust. Right. And wow. if we're at a point where we're saying, I uh, don't necessarily want to invest or put my money into blockchain or into Ethereum because I'm seeing that FTX just went down and most people don't understand the, the technology to begin with, yeah. then we're at a point where people are not going to accept it as a currency. And as long as this is not going to happen, we will see a huge fluctuation within the cryptocurrency world. And I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't know if that kind of reimbursement, when you're trying to maintain such a place as Web3, would really make a difference if people are not really... <laughs> You would see things like every time the thing crashes, people stop maintaining it, and I can I can see that there would be waves of of enthusiasm, and as there are right now, actually there are waves of these 
enthusiastic yeah, waves and, and, and negative wave, waves. waves. Yeah. But it's it's in so, in some ways it's a bit it's just a bit more extreme than the regular markets, right? In some ways you could say the same thing about Apple employees, right? So if Apple starts tanking for a moment, then you know the the morale I'm is down. I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm not an expert in crypto and I've, I read a lot mm -hmm. about it. And most of the time I just sit there and I'm like, what exactly are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And I think many people, including a lot of tech people, and I'm one of those people, don't understand what is going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually that's part of what I'm doing here in the show is I'm trying to make sense of these things. <laughs> yeah. And that says a lot. I mean, it says a lot if people who are really working in these fields and they're investing their time and not only working there but studying it doing research and they don't even understand it mm -hmm. how is a in german we would say autonomalverbraucher how is the typical person supposed to understand what exactly is going on how these technologies work well and, you don't but you also didn't know that about the dollar right so why is there inflation right we don't know this and, and most people don't understand it i mean maybe maybe you know, you can see, okay, in this case here right now, we can see it's a problem because of Russia and Ukraine and the food supplies and the oil supplies and the gas supplies. And so, okay, we get that. Most people get that. But it's explainable. That. Yeah, but thing. then how, why do we solve it by raising the interest rates, right? People will not get that necessarily. Right? So it is explainable. Yeah, it is explainable. You're right. But it's, economics is explainable. Everybody can study economics. Similar, but, 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 but in a way, those things are also explainable, right? You just have to specialize into this one area. If you really want to understand crypto, you, you can understand it. It just takes a lot of investment. I honestly think, and this is not a factual based uh, assumption that I have. It's really just an assumption mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. my experience with people who have worked in that field, from my experience with talking with them, meeting them. I even think that people who are work within crypto, I think there's only... A very very small percentage of people who actually understand it mm -hmm. and i think it's a huge hype same as ai mm -hmm. and i think you know this as well mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who talk about ai but actually very few who understand it yeah well and but ai is a whole collection of things right so if if, if a new algorithm comes that. out you know gpt chat gpt i don't understand it at this moment i haven't invested any time into it right but but i knew for example i learned about transformers last year right and and every year you have to keep up when you, when you specialize in an area you have to keep up with all of these fast moving parts because one reason why we don't understand it is because it's super fast moving right things change all the time in ai and and then the That's other the thing, thing about ai i think that you know, specifically in AI, I don't know, blockchain doesn't have sci-fi movies confusing people, but AI does, right? So AI has this idea that, you know, that there would be something like a Terminator that has its own intelligence and, and not only its own intelligence, but its own goals, right? That, that's, and and, and I, I see people getting confused about this element, even when they have studied AI, when they are uh, CEOs of major companies, even the the um, the CEO of, of OpenAI, um, uh, Sam Altman was was talking about AI as if it was its own entity with its own goals, right? Th that is how crazy that is. But but you can easily dispel this myth and say no, these are these are mathematical uh, models that are meant to optimize some kind of objective function that was put there by a human being, right? That we we designed we designed it to do something and it's doing that, right? We we can dispel this myth of its own you know owning its own goals, right? I mean, why would it? It doesn't have children to raise. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't need food. It doesn't need to pay rent. It, it has absolutely no reason to do anything of its own, right? It, it doesn't feel pain or anguish or any of those things. And so in that sense, it, I don't understand why so many people are confused about this one point, uh, actually. But but if you tell people that it's a mathematical model, that it's wiggling around some weights uh, in, in some model of, of, you know, neural network model, for example, where, where it's mimicked, you know, it's, it's, it's mimicked on some kind of biological um, yeah. You know, a model of the brain, but but nevertheless, it's just a mathematical model, right? And it's uh, optimizing some weights. And you can explain that within two minutes, five minutes, you you can you can dispel these kind of myths. I'm not sure if that's true about the blockchain, or even how many myths there are about the blockchain. I think uh, there are actually a lot of myths, specifically because we were talking about okay, we have uh, sci-fi that is mystifying AI so much. Mm -hmm. We have social media that is mystifying crypto. And oh yeah. Is, uh, 
mystifying blockchain and Web3. The whole reason why we're having this discussion right now is because we don't necessarily know what it is. Right. So, you know, we do have we ha we do have these outlets that are mystifying these these things. And one of the reasons is because if you mystify it and if you're able to sell it that way and if you're able to say, oh, this is the new big thing, people will rush to it and jump on it. Yeah. And yeah. we saw it with with AI happening. All of a sudden now we have different centers on AI. We You go to talks and you ask them, can you even can you define AI? And then the, the first thing you should actually hear from somebody who's really versed in that field would be it's hard to define AI because there's so many different ways to basically yeah. uh, program AI. Right. And there are different researchers who would use different def uh, definitions. So this is the main issue. I think there is a lot of buzz within blockchain, uh, a lot of buzz within crypto specifically, which is based on blockchain, mm -hmm. that is coming from people that are not necessarily versed in it. Right. And I think those people who see themselves as experts and who are putting themselves out there as experts, I think only very, very few of them actually understand it. They have the and opposite of the imposter syndrome. <laughs> right? They are actual imposters. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I wish I had this kind of self-esteem, you know? Yes, yes. Sometimes I, I wish, but that, that's, that's one of the main issues that we're facing right now. And I've seen it with friends who invested into blockchain because they listened to some expert who said that this was going to be the next big thing. And uh, they invest into a specific cryptocurrency because this person said this and this. So we never know what the agenda is behind people who are actually pushing this agenda because there might be investors of the cryptocurrency. There might be investors of a specific blockchain project. And that's why I'm saying have to be very careful when we when we have these discussions on who has real expertise in it and who doesn't, who's doing research in it and who doesn't, who's making um, promotions for it and who isn't. Um, and as I said, yes, with AI, it's it's a bit easier to to have these conversations because it's based on factual knowing and based on research. With blockchain, it's a bit harder. And we actually see this coming with this next topic, which is quantum. Oh, with yeah. quantum computing, I honestly don't get it. Uh, yeah. A friend of mine yeah. tried to explain it to me. I was like, yep, next seminar, I'm going to probably sit down and try and uh, understand it. But we see this wave coming now, too. Yeah. And this no, is I've, I've, I've spoken to some people in, uh, um, who know a bit about it um, at the Sanofi Institute when I was visiting there. And they um, they say that we're still quite far from having an actual... A mm -hmm. quantum computer that uh, you know of course if we did have one it, it would be um it would be quite powerful uh, they also say that oh, yeah. and, and of course crypto would be completely useless actually <laughs> that's i was just about to say that so one of the major projects that ibm is working on is actually a quantum computer mm. and uh quantum computers also like if, if we're able to achieve it at that point we're able to uh, very much work on other privacy issues and other privacy issues will actually erase from it, um, mm. which is a whole other topic. But it just goes to show that, just to wrap this up, it just goes to show that, uh, yeah, we are mystifying Web3 as much as we're mystifying other technologies. Um, we're probably doing it through different outlets, most importantly through social media and people yeah. who want to make a profit out of it. Um but we have to keep in mind that Web3 doesn't exist. It, at the end of the day, it's just a movement. It's not a real place that is out there that we can already use. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a movement. And the actual idea behind the movement is, in my opinion, a good one. Um, giving more autonomy to people, making sure that data is safe, that it's uh, that people are able to to enjoy their privacy, and that people are able to actually make use of their data. Fantastic. And that idea should be pushed more, honestly. This this idea should be pushed more, not only within the sphere of the web, but also in regulation, in mm. culture, in pop culture and whatnot. Absolutely, I agree. I, 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 I'm I also a big fan of Jaron Benier. And I've, you know, I've read his, his book, like I said, uh, some 
10 years ago or something when it came out. Um, a really, really amazing conversation with you. And, uh, you know, actually, you know, maybe I, I should give a real quick shout out to anyone who actually really knows something about quantum. I would really love to speak to you on this show. Well, please, uh, please, I'm going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. And, uh, well, you know, uh, thank you very much for, for coming on my show. And it was really fantastic to speaking with you. Uh, uh, speaking with you and and um, I guess you know I, I'm out of questions so um, uh, you know anyone out there though any uh, any anyone listening to this podcast if you do have some questions please post them in the comment section and uh, let us know and let's the, let's keep the conversation going and let's expand it but thank you very much Yasmin it was fantastic speaking with you thank you Hannes for having me it was really great thank you this show is published every week at 5 a.m. in New York City and Washington D.C. 2 a.m. in Los Angeles, 10 a.m. in London in the United Kingdom, and it is published in video format on YouTube and in audio-only format on Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Next week, uh, we'll be joining forces with Raj Shroff, and together we will attempt to dive deeply into deep fakes. So what are deep fakes? An accessible kind of uh, explanation for that is a deep fake is just a combination of two words using deep learning to create some kind of fakery. To take this into the next level of detail, it's basically using machine learning techniques to alter, to digitally alter, or even uh, fabricate images, videos, and audio. Now, if we let that definition sink in, we think about Oh man, what's this going to be used for? And I'm sure we'll get into this. Oh,